So the first question with any lead is, uh, and if, you're, if you are taking, this is one thing I probably write down, are they a real seller? That's the number one question you want to ask in the qualification process. Then the second question is, if they are a real seller, are they a wholesale seller? Okay. Most leads are probably going to be real sellers, but they might be a real seller in a year. They might be a real seller that wants more than retail. They might be a resale, a, a real seller that's already listed. They might be a real seller who's halfway out of their house and doesn't want to list. There's all these different circumstances. Okay. But the first thing is just, are they a real seller? Now, after they're a real seller, are they a wholesale seller? Then we want to make our offer. If they even could potentially be a wholesale seller. Now, I'm going to go into how, exactly how we break that down and what criteria we use. But I just want you to have the overview understanding that the number one thing is, are they, are they a real seller? And if yes, are they maybe a wholesale deal? <clears throat> if so, I'm going to make an offer. If I'm not sure, we'll talk about this as I go through this step, if the process of why we can sometimes still not be sure, then the tiebreaker is I'm going to make the offer. Okay. Like I said, if they're not a wholesale seller. So if they are a real seller, but they're not a wholesale seller, I'm still going to follow up. I'm, I'm going to follow up with them in the sense that they're a working lead, I'm communicating with them until either they do become a wholesale seller or they sell to somebody else. Or tell me to quit calling them. Okay, so how do we get them, the context of going into this call that we're gonna to use to get them to open up, to crack their shell. Like I said, we wanna connect with their emotional self to educate their logical self. <laughs> this whole thing about qualifying them and converting them is gonna be able to educate them because every single lead is going to want retail. A lot of leads are going to want more than retail when they start. Now, they're not always, they're not telling you up front what they really want or the lowest they take or anything like that. Okay, but we're going to start pretty much almost every lead at retail or higher. So until we crack their shell and really start dissecting it, we're not going to know if it's a potential wholesale deal or not. So as we go through this process here in the beginning, everything they're saying is kind of, we're kind of seeing it through, through a lens. Because if I ask you right now, what do you want to sell your car for? And you don't want to sell your car, or you're like maybe going to sell it, or, or even if you do want to sell it, you're not just going to tell me the lowest you'd take. And the same thing is true for houses. So what do you want for your house? We've coined the frame a million dollars. They want a million dollars, right? Doesn't matter really what number they say, until we go through this whole process, and get into the offer stage, that's when we're gonna start educating them, okay? So right now, everything we're doing is to crack the shell, connect with their emotional self, and get to their logical self so that then we can educate them as we go into the next step, okay? So the nine step qualification process and setup process is, uh, here's some of the keys, okay? You wanna have a calm, want to talk to voice, okay? Like a late night FM DJ voice, <laughs> instills confidence, it's trust, it's peaceful, it's easy to talk to, okay? Tactically empathetic, okay, but not necessarily sympathetic. The difference is empathy means I'm listening to you and I'm trying to understand and I'm showing you that I'm understanding, okay? Because I'm truly listening. Sympathy is I'm like, I'm, I'm going there with you. So for example, if somebody's got a situation with their house, the tenants are stressing them out, they don't know what's going on over there, they're scared, it's this crazy situation, right? And they're saying, like, well, I think my best bet is to just not do anything. They've paid for a while, and uh, I'm just going to let it ride out. I don't really know. They might be damaging it, but I don't know what's going on. Empathetic would be, oh, my goodness. I can understand how stressful that must feel. That's, you know, and, and reasoning, talking to that person, okay? And saying, I understand your pain. That makes sense. Repeating what they say so they know you're listening. Sympathetic would be saying, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, as long as you're happy right now, just keep doing what you're, you're doing, okay? So we're... Empathetic is, I hear you, I care, but I'm not necessarily going to just let you take me down that road. I'm going to listen and care, but then, right? So sympathy would be, I'm just, I'm just here to listen, like a friend. Empathetic's like, I'm here to listen, and then I'm going to help. But you got to show that you're here to listen and that you care first. That's, that's the empathy. Okay, so you do this, you show empathy by putting, the, the easiest way to do it, put yourself in their shoes. Okay, so you can feel what they feel. Your confidence allows them to confide in you. So literally, they give you the situation, we'll go through here in a minute how to get the situation from them. As they tell you these things, you've got to be able to kind of think, how must that feel for them? If you're thinking about the money, how cheap can I get this, based on what they're saying, that's not going to help you get there. 
trying to think the way they think and understanding what's going on in their life and in their situation, that is going to help you get into their head and, and, and feel what they feel and think how they think. And as you do, as you're empathetic with them and you care and you get to the education process that we'll talk about later, the confidence that you've showed through all of this, your demonstration of the market if that comes up, but not making it all about the market, really making it more about their situation and how you're going to help them, you know, that voice, is, is, it helps with that a lot, will then allow them that now you have the credibility, you have the trust. Now it's not just, well, I want this from the house, somebody else said they give me this, right? You actually know what's going on. They're worried about, well, what if the buyer doesn't perform? What if, what if they find out about this? Do I have life? But there's so many things going through as sellers, we can make a whole, whole list of them. You want to show hope for gain throughout this process. So everything you talk to them about, is hope for gain on this front end. Everything's very positive. The reason you're contacting them now, it's meant to be, we'll talk about cold calling on steroids later on. Uh, people so often will call back and say, how did you know that I was selling my house? Or how did you know I was about to sell my house? Like that's so weird, you'll, you'll hear that a lot. We just say, well, I don't know, it must just be meant to be. We're in the market right now, we need to buy a house. That builds value to a buyer so much more than just saying, well, we're professional house buyers in the market. You know, and I'm not saying there's not a time to say we're professional buyers and, and that's a separate issue, but I'm just saying the, uh, the essence of why the conversation is taking place will, is, a, is a way to build a lot of value, okay? You want to be talking about the best offer possible, okay? You're still going to hit them in an offer. We'll talk about the offer process lower that's going to make your gut ache to make the offer, okay? Because that's how the process works, and I'll explain why. But right now, you're setting them up because truly, if you don't get them your best offer possible, then that decreases your odds of getting the deal, right? So it's very easy to tell them, like, look, I want to get you my best offer because I know that you sound like a really intelligent person and I know that that's the best chance I have at us doing a deal today. Now, you're not setting them up saying, well, I'm going to pay retail. Okay, there's a big difference, but you are saying, I'm going to get you my best offer. There's four uh, personality types, direct, social, analytical, and weak, okay? Now, direct is they want, just get right to the bottom of it, do it right now, bottom line thinker, okay? You can get that person to, to do it, as long as they're a real seller, okay? Now, if you can agree on the price, they'll make a decision right now. Social, okay, those people that want to talk a lot, they want to connect with you, they'll make decisions quicker as well, okay? And you can get the deal on the spot. Analytical, now there's two types of analytical. Okay. There's the more sympathetic, um, and usually th th those when you, if you like Google the four personality types, you're not going to get weak. You're going to get analytical and then more sympathetic. Um, I'm combining sympathetic with analytical, and then weak is a totally separate thing that I'm going to talk about here in a second. But analytical, those thinkers might not necessarily close the deal on the spot. So when you know that you have someone who's an analytical thinker, I change my, my framing almost to like, I don't close near as hard. I don't go, I, I almost talk as if like, we're just going to go through this and they're going to take the information and think about it and get back to me type of thing. Now, when I get through the offer process and do the close, I will still do the closing process, okay? But if I do it right, they'll come back saying they'll be ready to move forward because they are going to take all the information and they're going to absorb it and they're going to make a decision. If I can allow them to do all that quickly and feel comfortable, they'll get to their decision much faster. <clears throat> Trying to close them or make a decision right now is going to work. Okay, and the weak personality, you don't get these as much, but this is the, the um, limp handshake, you know, type of person. You call them, they're scared to talk to you. You can't get anything out of them. You have to really build confidence in them just to get them to talk to you, okay? And then this process makes it pretty easy because it's so positive. So even if you get that, that uh, personality type, you're going to be fine. Pre-framing is huge in everything you do and it will be huge in every single step that we talk about in sales and closing. So pre-framing is like, um, it's a good pre-framing uh, example. If, uh, let's say I'm sitting on the couch and I'm supposed to be watching my weight or my diet, my wife's been telling me I've been having too much sugar and I'm some Ben and Jerry's ice cream. I say, Leash, you look so beautiful today. Like, there's just, you just glow, you know? And then I'm like, two minutes later, you know what sounds good? Some Ben and Jerry's ice cream, okay? I've done something to change her mindset that the next thing I'm going to do allows me to have better odds of getting what I want. Mm -hmm. That'd be a, it's kind of, kind of a silly example of a pre-frame, but you'll do, you want to start doing that in every single thing you do in sales. 
So that's why I said when the qualification process is going to lead to the offer and the offer is going to lead to the close, we're pre-framing throughout those whole processes. And we'll pre-frame on competition before we ever get to competition and all these. So for example, a small example of that might be if they even hint during this qualification process, we're going to get into the steps here in a minute. They hint about competition during that. I can already plant seeds on weekend seminars and wholesalers and how every deal that is done in town comes across my desk because I'm the real cash buyer anyways and I'm probably going to see it later and then they're going to renegotiate. Those aren't things I would normally say, but I might start pre them a little bit and then the degree of how much I need to continue to push those will come up later. But we're just pre-faming, we're just saying something now that's going to help us later. And you can say something that's going to add more impact to what you say or you can say something that makes them question something they maybe think. So if they said something you know is not true, you know, if it's a retail type thing to say, you can use pre-frames at different points in the conversation to start to change their thinking. <clears throat> Mirroring is uh, repeating the last few uh, keywords that someone said and matching their energy. So when we get through this, if we have time, I'd love to do a quick roll call. And whoever thinks they can be the hardest seller, I'll take you on. And mirroring is how I'll crack you. Um, it's basically repeating the last few words. So um, let me ask. Uh, let me ask Gordon. Um, okay, you don't want to give me the price for your house, and so I'm on, you're the seller. Okay, I'm the salesperson. We're on the phone, and I say, "How much do you want for a house?" And you're just going to give me variations of not telling me, right? Okay. So Gordon, how much do you want for your house? Oh man, you don't know. Um, no, maybe, I mean, I've done some research, but before I kind of give that out, I just want to see what you guys are what you're, what you're, what you guys are Perfect, okay. Super, super happy to, uh, to get you an offer. So you said you had done some research as well then? Correct. Okay. That was, we won't keep going, okay, because I would need to use another technique. You can't just mirror, 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 mirror. I'll talk about that more. But did you guys see what I did there when he said, I, you said, I don't know, and then I said, you don't know, and then you said, I've done a little research. You went another layer right there. I've done a little research. Yeah. Okay. A good thing, too, like, and I'll log into that here in just a minute, so I wouldn't do that. Okay. We talked about hope for game. Labeling. Okay, labeling always sounds, is always, you're always going to use one of these for phrases. These aren't the only phrases, it's always going to be one of something like this. It sounds like you feel, it feels like you want, it appears you are trying to, you're labeling whatever's happening, okay? So they might be a retail seller. I would label that, but let's say they're saying, I don't want to sell it to a realtor, I don't want to pay fees, I don't want people to go through my house, I don't want to do all that stuff. Okay, they, now these are flags, we'll talk about flags here later flags that this is potentially a wholesale deal, okay? And now, later in the conversation, that same person's telling you they're, they're not coming down on price, right? Now you could label them and say, it, it's, it feels like you really need to get retail. It seems like you really want the retail price of your house. So then I'm labeling them retail. Now, if you, I'm doing that specifically with this seller who said, I don't want to sell retail. So I'm saying things, it feels like, and I'm labeling what's happening and trying to get them to see it from a different angle. All they're seeing it as, I want this number. No, I'm not a retail seller, I don't want to do all that. I want this number, that's what I want. Oh, it feels like you want that number, that retail number, and labeling. Does that make sense? And uh, the takeaway. Now there's two sides of this. Um, the no, okay? No is the most powerful word and a lot of people think yes is the most powerful word in sales, especially most car salesmen, and it's not. It's an amateur's word. Uh, no is really what you want to get good at. So, for example, if I um, cold sales call you, Nick, and I start asking you questions trying to get you to say yes, you know, hey, it's a great, it's kind of a cloudy day today, isn't it? You know, you already know I'm a salesperson, okay? It's kind of a cloudy day today, isn't it? Yeah. Right? Like, you're already like, oh, shit, dude. Right? We're programmed, our whole society has been programmed that when a salesperson just keeps asking, leading us with questions that are going to make us say yes, we already start, our barriers already start coming up. I would rather have the person get the no out right away and then move from that. The other side of that is telling them no's will get a shift. 
So for example, if, you, if I say, what do you want for your house? And you say, and let's say we're in the offer process now. So we went through everything and we're, we are talking numbers now. And they say, well, I want 150,000. I make my offer, I say, I can pay 105,000. No way, I need 150,000. I can say, well, no, that's not gonna work. And leave it there. By, just by me saying, no, that's not gonna work, they're thinking, well, what's the next thing? Does that make sense? Now, if they say, okay, that doesn't mean the conversation's over. I still need to know what I'm going to say next, where I'm going to take that. But until I say no, I don't really know where they're at either. So mastering no, less yeses is going to be a big thing. Okay. One of the things, uh, one of the keys to this, if you can do it quickly on the phone with them is great, or before you talk to the lead, if you have the information to look it up is great. If not, then I always go look, look it up after the qualification call. But seeing how much they paid for the house, now this is pretty basic stuff, right? How much they paid for the house, how much they put down, and when they did the last refi, if they did. No, don't ask these questions. So if you ask these questions, hey, what'd you pay for the house? They're already like, you freaking salesperson. What the hell do you care what I paid for the house? It's not your business. What, do you, what, what, do you, what, do you, what will you pay me for the house? That's the question that, that they, they won't answer. But, it's the, but when you see that, you see what they paid, you want to be up with your marketing, targeting people that they can sell it to you at a wholesale price and they're still crushing it, okay? Financially, it's a win-win. The more money they put down, typically the more they'll value convenience and typically the easier they're going to be to educate later, okay? That's, it's a little bit of a stereotype, but I've seen it in data for 10 years. So FHA buyers who put no money down typically don't have any money to save and they're typically going to protect their nest egg their, their net worth in their house, because that is their net worth, as much as they can. Somebody who put a lot of money down is more of a planner, and when they go to move, they're, they, they, can, they, have a little, they can give up a little bit of equity in exchange for convenience or simplicity or to make their situation be solved easier. That someone who, that's their only net worth, just isn't going to be willing to make that, that move. Okay, so that, that's why I kind of look at that. Now, obviously, the last refi, somebody who refis all the time kind of goes in line with the person that puts no money down. Now, these are not exact. So I'm not saying, like, pull it up, like, shit, they bought FHA. It's not a deal, right? You just keep working the process no matter what. But it's just, we'll talk about flags here in a minute. The more equity they have, obviously, you know, and the more money they put down, those are really good, really good indicators. And we learned that, too. We looked back at, at, you know, hundreds of wholesale deals and looked at our avatar of what we were saying. It was like, pull this much. Okay, yeah. Uh, that one really stood out. Always stay one sentence away from their hope or fear. Um, does anybody know who Matt Larson is? Matt Larson runs yeah. Doug Graziosi's wholesale operations out of Quad City. So he taught me this one actually. He said, always stay one sentence away from their hope or fear. So if whatever it is, whatever their main point is of why they want to sell, we're going to use this method that we'll finally get to the nine steps here in a minute. But whatever their big thing is, so the house is a headache, the tenants are stressful, they're relocating. Whatever the reason is, that's what you want to stay one sense away from. And if they're saying something like, well, I don't want to use realtors, that's just so stressful, but I need to sell the house, you're always staying a sentence away. So when you get later to negotiating, and they say, well, I might have more, you, you're never more than a sentence away from being like, no, you need more, but how oh, nice is it going to be when next week you never have to think about these tenants again? Right? Or they're relocating across the state, they're trying to get there quickly. And you're a couple grand away, and you can you're one sentence away. You can say, "I know that it's going to be so nice when you're, you know, at the new place across the country with your grandkids next week, not not losing more time, you know, trying to get a couple bucks for your house." You always stand one sentence away, like we were talking about, from what's motivating them to take action and sell the property to you, not from not just the numbers. Set the stage, we talked about that. Why you contacted them, you can play that to your advantage as opposed to just, hey, because we buy houses. You never want to use the word flip. We stay away from the word flip. If they ask us, oh, are you guys going to flip the house? Do you guys flip houses? We say, and this is true for us, so the degree of exactly your word tracks and stuff, you guys, some of the stuff, you might tweak it a little bit, okay? But for us, we have a lot of rental properties. We're always buying one and selling, or selling one and buying more, doing 1031s. So for us, it's always, Really simple. We just sold one of our properties. We've got some cash burning a hole. We're going to pay some capital gains tax. If we don't find something, you've got me in a position where I really need to find something. I'm up against a timeline. So I might even have to, if I have to overpay a little bit, it's more important for me the location. Now all of a sudden, like we talked about before, they're like, man, maybe, maybe I should listen. This isn't just, you know, I want to get them off of, you know, I'm just a wholesaler or whatever. Okay. 
Yeah, Josh, really quick, I'll add to that, right? Because everyone else just wants to say, yeah, I'm a flipper. Right? So that's just another little piece that you stand out in. So, yep. so, and I'll mention to them, I'll say, you know, there, there are times if it doesn't work for us and where if we can help you, you know, we do sometimes do refurbishes. And oh, no, 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 my house is really nice. But sometimes I'll be the objection. It's like, by the way, they're thinking, so they're thinking, well, I can never sell my house, you know, wholesale because I have a really nice house. Only people sell their, you know, crap houses to a cash buyer. So you're literally going to get rid of that objection right away. If you yeah. think there might be an objection, we'll talk more about this, but you want to address it right away and get it off the table. Otherwise, it's going to sit there and you're going to be at the very end. You might even close them and it's still there and you're going to have a fall. All right, so some examples. Oh, I think we kind of talked about this guy, just gave you guys this. Recently sold property, have some cash burn and pull. There's another one you're supposed to look at. So here's a pre frame that you want to be doing right from the beginning. Why did you contact me? Well, I just talked about that, right? Just sold property. Got some cash burn home in pocket. We're going to get some capital gains. Is this me right here, the water? Sorry. This is the corner. Okay. Yeah. So the second side of that is I also, real early on, can tell them, yeah, I'm supposed to go look at this one tomorrow. It's like on the other side of town, terrible location. You know, and I, that might be all I say. Now, when I get to the offers or the process and the close process later, and they're like, all right, well, let us think about it. We've got a couple of people looking this week. I'm like, oh, that's great. The only thing is, I don't think, if you call me up after you guys are thinking about it, I'm probably not gonna have the money because the worst thing for me would be to pass up on the other house, hoping you call me back and say yes, I miss both deals, I'm screwed. You know, so now I'm creating a situation much different than just like, I thought I'd have a decision right now. And even if they still are like, well, just, you know, if that's what happens, that's what happens, because who knows what degree of motivation they're at yet, I can still call them up the next day, oh, this is a total pool, you know? So like now I'm even more, you know, what do we got to do? So it's not like I'm done, but again, I use that no thing. Like, well, no, like, cause, hey, can I just call you back if we decide to take your offer? No. I really politely told them, you know, I'd love to, but it's just not going to work. Does that make sense? How I pre frame that from the beginning, there's this other house, and now when I get to the close, I'm not just like, oh, here's this other one out of nowhere. It's sort of been kind of pre framed. So. Now, if they like you, they like the situation, they're thinking about it, now they're on tilt, you know? You might be able to speed that cycle up a little bit. That doesn't work as good with the analytical types. You guys remember what I was saying? Analytical people are the most programmed to like hate that anyway. So, I'm not saying you can't do it, I'm just saying that like, be a little more careful with analytical types. Direct, social, easy, all day. As long as you set up right and do it with content. Um, and it's usually true, like we're always, we've got appointments tomorrow, we're probably going to buy that house. We do have limited cash if it's one thing they want to once we're old. So everything I say, don't just be like, well, this Josh is just going to lie, or I'm going to have to lie to say that, right? You might have to tweak little things, but understand the why of what we're doing. Tweak it to work for you. And I'll, if you get hung up on one, we're here to help. <clears throat> you're up against a timeline to place the money, but completely flexible on close date, that's going to be key. Because when you bring it up, you're bringing up the sense of urgency, which is going to help you in pre-framing that. But a lot of people are going to be like, well, there's no way I could, you know, like Roger, my sales guy, he's always like, oh, we've got nine days. Like, he really, like, well, I mean, that sounds great, the whole situation, but, you know, there's no way we could be up nine days or close nine days or whatever. He's like, no, 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 that's fine. Because the way a 1031 works, too, for anybody who may not know, when you close on the sale of the property you sell, you have 45 days to identify properties that you're going to buy. And then you have six months to close on those properties. Okay? So... If I've got 45 days to buy something and 30 days have gone by, I've got to buy something in the next 10 days, or whatever money is sitting in that account from the property I just sold, I have to pay the capital gains taxes on that. Hey Josh, is that only in Arizona, or is that, I thought it was a year that uh, they had to put money in 10 minutes once. What's that? Is that only no, in that's IRS. Well, that's IRS. Yeah, that's yeah. IRS. Yeah, 40, yeah, 45 days to identify, six months to close. I wish it was the opposite, right? Because I'd rather have six months to cherry pick, and then once I find I'm going to close really quick. But yeah, 45 days and identify six months to close. Because we've used that for um, somebody who's selling a rental. You know, we're like the same other ways, trying to get them to do something like maybe owner financing. Absolutely, so they don't have all that capital gains. Owner financing makes a ton of sense for an investor like that. A lot of people, they want to convert their portfolio, but they want retail. You show them, look, you can stay passive and enjoy all the things you've always enjoyed and get rid of the headaches of, of being a landlord that you don't like. It's just all some terms. <laughs> All right, so the nine step, let's get into it. These are the nine questions you're going to ask. 
is on every single thing. Uh, Christian, do you have the lead sheet? Give me just a second. Let me make sure everybody gets one. Oh, no, okay, perfect. You guys you I, I, I already passed them out. You are the man. Okay. <laughs> so on the back of these guys, real quick, grab your sword. On the front of these is the nine step method. Okay. The back side, we'll talk about that when we get to the offer process. Okay. Don't even worry about the back side right now. Okay. So we talked about how to get them to open up. We've got to crack their shell. We've got to connect with their emotional self to get to their logical self. We can, the other side of mirroring I didn't talk about as much. You know, mirroring, we can repeat the last few keywords that they said, and they'll just keep talking. That's essentially what mirroring is. The other side of mirroring is matching tone. On the phone, it's going to be basically tone. That's really the main thing you have. In person, you can also match the way they sit, the way they, whatever, because everybody wants it's a, just a psychological thing. You connect with someone when you talk the same way, dress the same way, you know, etc. Have some stuff in common. So if someone right away is, hey, what do you want to give me for the house? Uh, you guys buying a house, huh? You know? <laughs> yeah, we absolutely got a whole burden in our pocket. We just sold one. We got to buy one. You know, if somebody's, hey, yes, so I got this letter in the mail. Uh, what exactly is it that you guys do? You know? Well, um, so glad you asked that. We actually just recently sold a property, and we need to buy a property. And so it's actually a really good time if you are interested in selling. I'm not sure if you are, but this is a perfect location, so I'm really glad you called me back. Right? Two totally different things. Based on simply how the person was, the first sentence they told me. I already knew about that. The first guy was probably a direct, um, a direct or social, right? Loud, bubbly, boom. And then the second person was like slow, quiet, little thinking about what they're saying a little bit more. Yes. All right, so this is how I answer the phone. This is how we answer the phone in my office, I should say. Hi, this is Brandon. Hi, this is Josh. Hi, this is Andrew. Roger. Um, it's real simple. And the reason we do hi, this is Kevin, hi, this is Don, whoever, is because it sounds very um, organic. It sounds very friendly. That if, you know, hi, this is Greg. Hi, this is Susan, whoever. Now, if you're doing real branded mail, James might have a little bit of a different take. I don't know, I'll let him talk about how they answer the phone, but, and it's real random, you might say, you know, hi, you know, 1-800-STALL-HOUSES, okay? But the way we do it, especially with CCOS, which I'll talk about later, hi, this is Josh. And they'll say, hi, this is Don, I got your voicemail, or I got your letter, or somebody told me to call you. you say, awesome, fantastic, I'm so glad you called me. I just walked into the office, can I get the address from you again so I can pull up my notes? Okay, now on the sheet you guys are looking at, real quick guys, at the top, you've got campaign and date. Okay, that's just for you to real quick so you can track your marketing. Okay, uh, the name, they're going to say, yeah, my name's Bill, I got your thing, whatever, so you got their name. Okay, their phone number is showing up, so that's you obviously don't have one not their phone number. But these, they're, they're, each one's numbered for where you're at here. So, address, okay. Now the reason we say I just walked in the office, can I get the address if you get to pull up my notes, obviously, you know, for most of us, almost always, if we're doing any type of volume in our marketing, it's not like we called three people yesterday, you know, and have the address sitting on our desk. It's like we called 10,000 people yesterday. I don't know who it is. But by saying, I just walked into the office, can I get the address from you again to pull up my notes? It, it, it's framing it so that to them, like, you do remember this house, or you do have something on this house, but you want to save them some time. They don't want to sit there on hold. So if they say, well, you called me, you should have the address. I just said, no, I totally do. If I can get it from you again real quick, I can pull up my notes in my computer. I, I don't want to keep you waiting. If they're still like, no, it's fine, I'll just be like, okay, can I call you right back? Okay, that's like almost never going to happen. They're going to give me the address. Okay, and then what I'd like to do there is start to pull it into, in our market, it's, uh, we use MLS to come on for tax records so I can see what they bought and paid and all that kind of stuff. Um, so you guys, if you don't have MLS access, you can start to be pulling it up on Zillow. Now, if you're brand new, practice this script, even if it's in, with a friend or on the, on, in the front of the mirror or whatever, and then as you're practicing this script, practice this script as you're pulling up a property. So you can actually do kind of two, because it only takes you a minute to type in the address. So what I do is, great, just walked in, the, walked in the office, can I get the address from you again so I can pull up my notes? Oh, sure, it's 123 Main Street. Okay, great. 123 Main Street. And I'm typing it, right? Now, as I'm typing, I say, great, one, two, three, Main Street. So what do you want for it? Okay, that's asking price number one. It, the whole premises of this, it rolls right off the, rolls right off my tongue, right away, catch them off guard, be casual, be loose, match their, mirror their tongue that they just gave you. And a lot of times they'll give you something right away.
Now remember, whatever they give you, it's going to be a million dollars. So don't be like, fuck, retail lead. You're already fucking, sorry. I'm going to try to be better for the camera. <laughs> 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 I feel like so far that I brought two like that. Um, you, you, you want it to sound natural. Whatever they tell you is an indication of the way they're thinking. Remember, this whole thing, we're trying to think the way, we're trying to get into the way they think so we can educate them at the next step. We're not trying to beat them up on price. Totally, totally different objective. So asking price number one. Now, so again, I'm pulling up the address. Awesome, give me just a moment while I pull that up. So what do you want for it? Now, a lot of times before I get to that, they're gonna say, I don't know. I don't know what it's for. Okay, there's a couple things. We've, I've got in here when I get to objections later, the objection slides um, that will help with that. But the easiest one, if you want to get, because everybody should have one, two, three, kind of their go-tos um, for word tracks on all the different objections. We'll get to that stuff. But is, well, what are your neighbors selling their houses for? Right? So, okay, great. Can I pull up my notes? So what do you want for it? Well, I don't really know. I just kind of think, I thought maybe you'd be able to give me an idea what it's worth or what you'd pay for it. Oh, awesome. Well, what are your neighbors selling their houses for? Kind of like mirroring, they gotta say something again, right? And if they and then if they say, well, I don't know, the one guy down the house sold this for 150. I could mirror that. Oh, so the guy down the house sold this for 150. Well, yeah, I mean he it was with the realtor. I think it was you're right. He just starts telling me more stuff. Okay, but it's casual. Don't worry about it if it's a million dollars. That's my point. It's fine. Just get an idea of how they're thinking. Now we want to get into occupancy. This is going to start to tell us what's going on with the situation, what the timing is, all that kind of stuff without sounding like a salesperson. That's great. Let me see if I can get you a price you like. Okay, I'm pre-framing positivity, pre-framing them that I'm not just a wholesaler trying to flip their house, whatever, but without saying anything that I don't want to say. Okay, great. Let me see if I can give you a price that I like. So is this the house you live in? Now what I did on the front end, like I just said, that's hope for game. That's what H4 plus means, hope for game. And then I'm also using tone as a positive tone as I do that. Now, we're still up here at the top under occupancy. Okay. Now, if so, uh, okay, it's it's either gonna be owner occupied or not first, right? They either live there or they don't. Okay, so if it's owner occupied, you would say, awesome, I'm sure it's a very nice home. Because everybody wants to be complimented on their home, right? And even though they know they're shit, it needs to be fixed, right? But they're gonna be like, oh, like it's starting to make them feel good and like you, and you know, you're showing empathy. Because obviously, they, what did they want? You put yourself in their shoes. They want as much money for their house. If you're showing empathy and understanding that, where are you moving? Uh, across town, out of state, whatever. Oh, that's awesome. When are you moving? Okay. Now, if they're if they don't know when they're moving and they don't know where they're moving, that's a flag. We'll talk about flag later, but that tells me kind of where they're at in the cycle. If they say, well, I've already packed up all my stuff, I'm already living in the new place, I've just got a couple things left to get, and I might ask them, like, oh, great, have you, have, why didn't you listen to the realtor? Just to see what they say, because they might just say, oh, I don't really want to do that, right? Because they've already gotten all the way to where they've moved out and it's not, they haven't listed it yet. So when and where they're moving, that tells you a lot about the situation. It tells you a lot about the cycle of what's happening without asking, like, well, how quick do you want to sell me the wrong thing? Now, if it's not owner-occupied, then obviously what are the other two options, vacant or rent? If it's vacant, you want to know how long it's been vacant and who lived there last. Well, it's vacant, but was it vacant because the person died a month ago? It's a perfect house. Is it vacant because it's been vacant for 10 years? You know, we've, that's actually happened to us. Where has it been vacant? Because it was a rental property. If it was a rental property, like did the tenants take good care of it? You know, this stuff, that is, is gonna be huge. Who lived there last? Again, was it, they might say it's vacant, and you're like, oh, just assume it's a rental property. It's good to ask this, because they might say, oh no, my kid lived there, my family, or whatever, and that's gonna change your tone. You're not gonna hammer them on tenants and pre-framing how tenants don't take as good care of a property if it was their family lived there, right? Unless they tell you, man, she, or my nephew, or whatever, right? My son, he trashed my house. Then it's cool. Don't never stay one sentence away from their pain, right? So then later, like, I know you want an extra five grand, but like, how nice is it to, you're gonna have this resentment for your son anymore for living here for free and, you know, this thing you bought for college. Now, if it's rented, what you want to know is, is it month to month or is there a long-term lease in place? And the reason you want to know that is because if it's month to month, you have a lot of flexibility when you go to sell this deal, assuming you write the contract. If it's a long-term lease, you're gonna kinda have to navigate through that. Some buyers might like the numbers to flip it, but they're like, I'm not gonna wait nine months. 
to whatever. So either way, remember the whole point of this call is to connect with them, figure out what's going on, get rapport. So don't you're not like, oh well that's bad if they say like it's about a nine month latency. So you're just like awesome. You're just taking in all the information. Okay, so now we know the occupancy, who lives there, how long it's been vacant, or if they live there, when and where they're moving. And that should tell us quite a bit about the situation and timing. Now, in all that, they might have told you why they're selling and some whole bunch of other information. In fact, some people, right when you call them, will just start telling you all the information. Okay? It's called, we call it vomiting information. And it makes our job easier, usually, but you don't want them to just go on a tangent forever either or start selling you. Right? So what we do when somebody starts bombing information, we fill in all the things that we need to know and write down any notes that are, that are going to be important or help us. And then we grab control back of them if they, you know, after we've gotten that. It's, and then fill in any gap, go right back through the process, get anything they didn't tell us. And then we'll get, get into the offer process next with that lead. So my point is don't be like, well, hold on and, and like stop them if they're telling you all this stuff. Just let them tell you everything. Well, it's really easy, and then go back and fill in anything they didn't tell you. Okay, so after you get your occupancy, okay, a lot of times, like I said, that'll kind of tell you why they're selling and what the timeline is. But it's still really important to ask them, okay, great, so why are you selling now? Because they might go a whole other layer and tell you a whole second reason. That, so don't just assume you already have it. The other side, they might not have really told you. You might know the occupancy and stuff, but you're still like not really sure why they'd be selling you now. And maybe it's just because you call them and maybe they would only sell if it's retail or maybe there's something totally. So it's very important to ask the question, okay, why are you, so why are you selling it now? And you, you've already asked a few questions, everything's been easy to talk to, positivity, so it's not like you're like grilling them. You know, you've set it up to this. You're three, three minutes into the conversation right now. After they tell you that or don't tell you that, whatever they tell you, that's the thing with all these, right? Cool, keep it easy, keep flowing. Because any answer tells you something. Then you want to get the property information. Now, when, you, when you're getting the property information, you do not want the seller selling you. So, if they're telling you, oh, so fantastic, it's got granite, we recently, we just put money into the backyard and all these things, we'll talk about retail flats, that's a retail flat. Nothing's moving closer to a deal as they're sitting there doing that. Now, I'm not saying don't be empathetic, and they're like, yeah, well, we have put a lot of money into this house. You know, this happened, you know, last year we had to replace this. We had to do that, and they start kind of telling you stuff they've done to the house. There's a difference between are they selling you the house or are they just telling you what's going on? So if they're getting, so it's okay to let them tell you like what the house is and stuff, but when it just becomes they're just selling you on it, you'll know. Get off of that. And then what a lot of wholesale sellers will be is they don't really want to sit there and talk about the house forever. They want to know what are you going to give me? Let's get right down to the bottom of it. I got equity. I want simplicity. I want these. I don't want to sit here and you. Try to make me say yes a whole bunch of times and then make me feel like I'm in a car show until I do what you want to do. I just want you to tell me what you'll give me for the house, right? That's their frame of mind, so great. Let me just get a couple questions from you really quick, okay? Uh, now, my market, some of you guys might be different, and my tax record is so square foot, it doesn't show bedrooms and baths unless there's a prior MLS listing, so I always like to just conf confirm beds and baths, okay? And these are all, well, these are all on the sheet, by the way, okay? Square footage and the lot square footage, the age of the house, for the year it's built. If there's any additions, if so, you know, are those permitted? And in our market, we can tell if it's in the square footage in the tax records, it was probably permitted. If it's not, then probably wasn't. Um, how, how's it been maintained? And we can just ask them on a level of one to five, or have you maintained, is it really well maintained? Like, you know, is there anything that needs fixed? So the HVAC age, the roof age, what kind of floors and what kind of counters? Some of this stuff, like I said, you might already have the year it was born, the square footage, some of the year it was born, year it was built, square footage, some of that other stuff. And so you could maybe, if you wanted somebody who's a very direct, just you know, wants it, make it make it easier for them trying to get rapport. You already got that stuff. Well, cool. Can it just how's the AC? If that's an AC, assuming because might be markets like in Arizona, that's a very important thing. If not, don't worry about that one. Okay, but everybody, roof is a big one, obviously. Now floors and countertops pretty much are usually going to give you like 70 to 80 percent of what a house looks like. If you say, hey, uh, great, what kind of flooring do you have in your house? Well, it's linoleum and the kitchen and bathrooms and then carpet and the uh, bedrooms. And the house was built in the 80s. You know, you're like, it's probably kind of like what it was built with. I know some of your markets are going to have different finishes or whatever. But if they say, oh, it's got granite countertops and we just did new cabinets last year and then and hardwood floor, 
right? And the, the floors and the countertops really give you a good indication of what you've got. Oh, that sounds like a really nice house, or like, oh, it's just base, or whatever, without asking a million questions. Now, if the house is before 1990, some of the things we'll like to start touching on here is, uh, you know, oh, okay, if the window's been updated, uh, in some markets that might be prior to 1980, you know, because anything new nowadays has the newer style windows. But if it's an old house, that's, a, that's an expensive thing if they haven't been upgraded yet. And then, has the electrical been updated? Has the plumbing been updated? And then we always ask him, oh, so is that the original sewer line? And they're always like, we don't know. I'm like, okay, it probably is. And that, that's, a, that's a good one. So you just, you pre, what this, kind of this stuff is, A, you need to know it, so you can figure out your numbers and where to make your offer later. But the other part is it's also pre-framing that. Oh yeah, shoot, the roof is 10 years old. So when you get to the offer process, they were just thinking about, they're not forgetting all that stuff. They're actually laying in what they need to weigh in. But again, whole point of this call, keep it positive, roll, get the information. So I'm not hammering on anything. I'm just taking it off. Oh, that's great. And they're like, yeah, but it, it's not really that bad. I mean, it's a, it's a small leak, but we patched it. Roof should be good for another 15 years. Oh, that's fantastic. Cool. So we don't have to do the roof right now, right? I can hammer it later when we're talking turkey and I've got it in a minute. Right now, I'm just like, I want to stay, I want to, I, want to, I haven't gotten paid all the myself yet. He's still being emotional on his house. Okay. Now I'm going to start going into the value proposition. And a lot of times we might have touched on this in the beginning. Uh, if they call in and they say, like, well, what do you guys do? You know, then you've got to kind of hit on your value proposition. And they already saw it, too, when they got your marketing. Your value proposition is always going to be the same in wholesale. As is, no fees. You get to pick the move out date. And whatever other problem you have is going to go away. We're going to make the easiest sale of your life. And that's why I named my wholesaling business is Easy Button Home Sales, where we give you the easy button. So you remind them of all of that right before asking price number two. So asking price number one, we go back to the beginning. Great, so we want for the house. They're like two hundred thousand because like Zillow's one eighty and their neighbors have all been listing for one eighty and selling for one sixty. And they're like, we want two hundred. Like, Great, it sounds awesome. You get down to the bottom. You just touched on. There's no fees. There's all these other things. And hopefully, as you went through the call, you found out you got flagged that told you that they're going to like hearing those things. So now you're touching on it again, telling you know the value. You don't need to go into money yet, like how much savings that is. You just mentioned, if you are gonna, you could just say, you know, that's probably gonna be 10, 15% savings off the top right there. So with all that being said, you know, what would it take that you'd actually walk away with, okay? Another way you could think of it is, number one, you're just asking them for a gross asking price. Number two, you're saying, okay, after all, since, I'm, since you're not gonna have to pay any fees, there's gonna be no work, anything like that, that you'd otherwise have to pay, what would you be willing to do a deal with me, okay? And again, if it's still a million dollars, we don't really care. So we have an offer. they wanna hear our offer before they're gonna put their hand out. And the way we're gonna get their hand out, I'll get this in the offer process, is that we're gonna make them tell us, no, okay? That's, that, that's why we want that pit in our stomach. We need that to happen. <clears throat> now after that, we're going to set the call back or the appointment, depending on which way we're going to do the closing, like James and I talked about. So James's office, much heavy right here, they, get, they would have all that info, and they, have a, they don't use the exact same script. They would get here and great, you know, I've got somebody can be in your area tomorrow at 9 or 11. Okay, for us, it's great. Are you going to be at this number for about 20, 30 minutes? Let me do some homework real quick. Come up with my number, I'm going to call you back and give you an offer. If you like it, I can send you an offer, I can come meet with you. If you don't like it, you can think about it or tell me no. No worries. Removing all friction. I don't want any friction in anything I do. Now they're excited for me to call back. They're excited for the number without any fear that I'm going to pressure them. And everything I just did, I didn't make them say yes to much. I didn't sound like a salesman. I took all the friction out of everything. I was empathetic. They're not worried about it. They're, 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 it's not going to be hard to get them on something yet. If it is, then you know you're doing one of some or all of those things wrong on the front end. <laughs> So, okay, totally get it. I think that's probably quite a bit. Okay, so here's the other thing. If you get to asking price number two, and you know that they're a real seller now, and you think they might be a wholesale seller, this is the first hint that you start to take away a little bit of hope for gain. You're still doing hope for gain. I'm gonna give you an offer, and no worries what you think about it, but you can use a pre-frame. It's the first time that you're gonna use any type of a pre-frame that's a negative one from their view, but you're doing it very subtly. Okay, I totally get it. So let's say now, front end they wanted 200, okay? Houses are selling for 160. Some of them are listed at like 180 or whatever, that were listed high, that are wide high. When I get to the bottom of the call, I know all kind of what's going on. I've talked about the difference of, of if they were to sell the retail route. They give me another number, and let's say now they give me 
160, right? I just went from lower retail to like, well, that is actually kind of what they're selling for. Okay, great. Um, it's probably quite a bit more than I can pay, you know, for a cash offer and make everything work for both of us. But give me 20 minutes and then back to the hope for game. So it's the first pre frame that, like, look, everything we've talked about is still going to happen, but you might not like my offer. I'm starting to get them to think. Because now I know why. Now, if they're just retail, 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 realtor, there's nothing, I'm like, I don't know, this is probably a retail one. I'm, not, I'm still going to be more positive here until I hit them with the offer and do my homework. Because right now, too, usually, you're not going to sit here and underwrite the property while you talk to them. You might pull it up in Monsoon so you, or Zillow so you can see a couple of flags and kind of have a quick idea. But if you're looking at the screen trying to figure out like all the tax information, comps, all that kind of stuff, then you're not doing any of the empathy, mirroring, listening, finding out what's going on, none of the psychology that Okay? So you wrap it up, you pre-frame them, you're going to give them an offer, it's going to be super easy, no big deal. If you think, this one sounds pretty good so far, hit them with, you know, I don't know if I can get there, but I'm going to try to get as close to it as I can. Let me see, maybe I can. It's just a very light pre-frame. Again, I just talked about this, just some examples so I can do that. Um, I kind of just went over this. I'll, so like I said, if you think you're in the ballpark, this is basically just the options I'm going to give them with the offer. So it's going to be around in 20 minutes. I make sure that, because what I don't want to do, I've got a hot lead right now. I want to like strike while the iron's hot. I don't want them to be like, well, I'll be home this evening. Call me this evening. If they do that, it's a flag for less motivation. I want them, hopefully I've built the excitement, got them to a place where like, they want the offer. And they're like, oh yeah, I'll be here in 20 minutes. OK, great. Is this your home or cell phone? Oh, this is my home. OK, do you have a cell phone? Yeah. <laughs> you know, whatever. But don't like fight them on it either. Everything's easy. No pressure. Okay, some of the flags, talking about flags, as we go through those nine steps, okay, by now we should have a pretty good idea for most sellers. Some of them might have kind of held their cards the whole time. So on each one of those steps, as you do this, you're going to be able to go deeper and deeper and handle more objections. Okay, but some of the flags you're looking for as you go through all the stuff, remember we're going, we're keeping it smooth. This whole call we want to take five to ten minutes, that's it. So we're looking for flags. That, like I said, is it? So we already know. But it's going to be real easy at the end of this call if they're a real seller or not. But it's going to be are they a wholesale seller or not? Those are the flags we're looking for. Now, if we're not getting the flags, that doesn't mean we're going to make an offer unless we like confirm the flags. So that's why I go back to if there's a tiebreaker, still make the offer. Now, the reason we won't make an offer if they're higher than retail or the timing's not there yet is because we'll probably never hear from them again. If the timing's not there yet, it doesn't really matter what we pay unless we overpay, they're not going to buy the house. And if they want over retail, we know the timing's not right. Even if the timing in their head to sell is right, they do want to sell right now, the, their cycle mindset as a seller has not gone through what it needs to to get to a wholesale offer. Does that make sense? So all you're going to do is lose them. Better to say, well, look, why don't we follow up? When you're ready, we'll take a look at it. We'll get you our offer as much as we can pay. If I got you an offer right now, it's, it's going to be different from, and you call me in a month or six months, it's going to be different depending on the market, and more importantly, how much money I have available. But I want to pay you as much as I can. So it's just all hope for game, boom, 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 so that they save your number, put your magnet on the phone, and call you back. Or maybe they were kind of bluffing still, and they're like, well, I mean, maybe we would move it up. Right? So that's a way, again, we talked about using no. You can kind of pull away and use a slight no. Anytime they're coming towards you, that's a good thing. So when you're not sure, it's a tiebreaker. And then you make your offer and there's still no reason, they're just a retail seller. All you can do is follow up. But if they start giving you reasons, that's where you know, holy, maybe I can educate them. Maybe I need to apply a little bit more aggressiveness. Be a little more harder to close when I get to close. So some of the flags for, uh, that you want that are really good to hear. Now, before I say this, the, if you hear the good flags, you can't just assume, oh, it's a deal. I mean, you want to be telling yourself everything to deal no matter what. We talked about that. But, and then the flip side of it is, if they give you the retail flags, you're not like, oh, it's a retail deal, there's nothing here, right? Every deal is a deal until it can be. But we do want to listen to the flags, we're being a detective. So if they say they dislike realtors, obviously that's a big flag, or fees, if they say they don't like showings, don't want people coming over, maybe they have a pet, child, health situation, whatever, and you can read between the lines and know the showings are giving pain in the butt, they said, you know, kind of goes with realtors don't like fees. Um, this is a big one for us. I would say like 80% of our business at least. They just don't want BS. They want the easy button. Like I said, there might be a little more to it. You know, they also have equity and they also want to sell now. But 
They want the easy deal. Somebody that they like and everything makes sense, they're happy with. If the property needs work, obviously that's going to give you a little bit of leverage. If they have any type of financial situation, obviously that's going to give you a little bit of leverage. The thing is, you guys see how low that is on the list? Like most, I would say most, uh, you know, wholesaling education out there, they're going to tell you look for property that needs work or financial situation. Those are distressed lists. There's tons of deals there, okay? But if you're only thinking those are the places that you're going to get deals, you're going to miss becoming rich. Because everybody's going to get the really easy ones, and not very many people, no matter how good of a closer you are, are going to get the really hard ones. The wealth is made in the middle. Okay, so any type of a stressful situation, always be listening for those. Any type, remember, one sentence away from their hope or one sentence away from their fear. So if you know the stressful situation, you're always staying a sentence away from that. Problem of tenants, of course, that always gives you leverage. Okay, now retail flat. Oh, we're still on retail flat, I'm sorry. If they're already listed, that's, that's kind of retail flat. Now, as a side, as a very important thing, um, what do you do when it's listed? Okay, listed ones are so easy because you can condense this whole script into you 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 see that it's listed, or you ask them, great, what's it listed for? Then you look at how long, and you say, are they flexible? Okay, so you see that it's listed at 300, and it's been listed for 80 days, and they started at 309. Now they're th and they went to 300 after 45 days. Now it's 90 days. They're still at, at that price, so they barely bumped a little bit. Comps are fat or less. Wholesale would be way less. Okay, or are you very flexible, right? Now if they say no, not really, you know, then you're like, okay. Well, is there any any type of situation maybe that I could help with, or is there any is it pretty much just an easy? You're just waiting for the right buyer, whatever. But no, it's waiting for the right buyer. Pretty much there's retail. There's nothing you can really do. But if they say, yeah, I'm not kind of flexible, or I might be flexible, then I want to know, kind of at least feel them out. Well, like how much? Like a couple thousand bucks? Or like, you know, if I can get you a cash offer and this is just a done deal, you can close quickly and I'll take care of any problems, whatever. And they're like, oh no, that'd be great. I need that. And then the conversation keeps going. Okay? So the situation. And then what's, and then, so I'm looking for a situation for them to tell me that they're flexible. If it's no and no, just kind of like, okay. Why create possible drama with another realtor for somebody who hasn't just said, I want help. Now I'm kind of stepping on somebody else's steps. But if they say, yeah. Now I will tell you, we've done tons of deals that have been listed over the years. Um, where we're actually talking directly to the seller or the realtor. Usually what it comes down to the agent relationship if it's going to be a wholesale deal. The realtor is their friend or a friend of a friend or just really it hasn't been able to, to get it done for them and just really wants to see the seller be able to accomplish what they're going to happen. With those, you've got a fighting chance. If it's a realtor, oh, you're a wholesaler, oh, they wouldn't sell it for, you know, it, it's going to be really hard. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's not amazing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, are you flexible? Is there any type of situation? If so, we keep talking. If not, not a lot I can do. Now, what you can do is just follow up with it a week, a month, whatever, and see if it's still listed. If it sells, you're done. If it gets canceled or doesn't sell, you could follow up. But until you see a flag, like they had a list price reduction or something weird, like it went under contract and fell out, you're still looking for leverage. So if you call them back, you're still just like, hey, I see you're still listed. It kind of goes back to the same thing. Are you flexible? So same type of thing. They're really smart. They might be saying like, oh, I'm going to list, right? They're, it's not their first rodeo, even though they know like, I'm not staying with the realtor. I'm not having people come through my house any of that crap, you know? But this guy that you're talking to, he's got four years worth of sales or whatever too. Um, if they're not sure when, when and where they're going to move, like we talked about, you know, that's kind of a retail flag, but they do want an offer. So that's where we kind of pull away, you know, and just let them know, like, well, just because you're, I'd love to get you an offer, a location is perfect, but based on your timing, your timing, I don't know, I hate to give you an offer and then later we miss a video for a couple bucks because my cash situation is different or whatever. And now do they come towards me and they're like, well, maybe we could, we could do it a little quicker. If, or do they say, all right, that makes sense. Yeah, cool, no worries. Right, trying to read between the lines. If they're all about the money and they're not giving you a situation and you've done all the things we've talked about, probably retail. If they're unrealistic, they're probably retail. About the, the money or the situation. Now, also, before I get to that, they could be unrealistic because of stress and other things and you just haven't gone through their, just their emotional self is so, you know, but they do have an analytical self, you're just not there yet. So that's why I say if everything's a deal until you pull it out. Just because they're unrealistic, if there even might be a deal there, you're going to still go into the next stage, which is the offer process. If they won't let you educate them, 
it's a big red flag. Retail flag, especially if you go through all this, you're like, I'm not sure. Tiebreaker, I'm gonna make the offer. You make the offer, they still won't let you educate them. Don't fight an uphill battle. Go back to Mr. Nice Guy and give, reiterate, hey, like, if you guys want the easy button, blah blah blah. If you want to sell it quick when you're ready. All at that point, you're, you're, what you can do is make an impression, and maybe when they become a real seller or possibly a wholesale seller, that they call you back. But you're not going to turn it into a deal today. If that's what you've got. Then do all that, done your job, and still with a positive mindset, and they still won't let you educate them. Just, just reiterate your value proposition if you want. You don't have to be yourself a fuck work. I can work that way or not. Uh, if they're worried about you being an investor, now it's different if at the front end they're like, well, are you an investor? I don't know. Like I said, we can we want to get rid of that objection and move forward. It's probably not their key thing. But if that keeps showing up and that really is like their thing, it's kind of like it's all about the money, right? All right. Objection annihilators. Okay, as so we're going through all this, these are some common objections you guys are going to see. Anybody who's got anyone that I don't hit, um, drill me with it when we get through this. Talked about the elephant in the room. If there's an objection coming up or lingering, put it out there, extinguish it before it turns into a bomb later. Most salespeople want to do the opposite. They don't want to address the thing. They'd rather just like, oh, I'm just not going to say anything about that. That's it. Don't do that. If you're in a tough spot, you want to defuse it, own up to it. So let's say on a, you made your offer and you came in high and now you're, you got to call back and be like, you know what, like I screwed up. You're better off to call back and be like, I screwed up, I'm an idiot, I'm so sorry. You don't have to call yourself an idiot, but my point is own up to it right away. Defuse it and now maybe you can talk about it. If you just call and try to beat around the bush, you're just losing credibility and, and uh, you're poor. And that goes for everything. Right? Like, I mean, that's a big thing just to just deal with it right now. But even from a sales perspective, the psychology behind it, that's what you have to. We talked about pre-frames. So you're gonna, you, you can pre-frame a lot of things that would be objections or you sense could be an objection. You can start to pre-frame them and hit the objection without the objection ever actually becoming a direct conversation. You guys follow me? So they could say something that kind of hints that they're worried about being, being an investor, and then I could use my line on how we have rental properties and we just sold one, we might have to overpay a little bit right now because it's timing. I'm kind of pre-framing them to like, they're not just trying to flip their house based on the objection that they kind of handed around that I thought might be there instead of just avoiding it. We talked about mirroring, labeling, feel felt found is a way to label. So when somebody is saying, you know, it's been a stressful situation with the tenants, you can label that. It feels like you're really stressed out about these tenants. I remember one time when I felt really stressed out about tenants, and somebody came along and they happened to, to, be, to be in a position where they wanted my house, and I'm in the business, and I just got unleashed that one, and I felt so relieved. Feel felt found. It's kind of like, you know, just, just in line with labeling, it is labeling, but again, it's trying to get them to look at what's going on from a different perspective, and it uses empathy in doing so. Again, this stuff all makes them feel appreciated and it makes them feel understood. So these common objections, um, what I would encourage you guys all to do, and I, I will have these slides for you guys and stuff, so no worries, but list all the worst things that the other party could say, okay, about you or about what you're doing. And if you think that this is what I was talking about, about the elephant in the room, if you think it's going to come up, you can bring it up earlier or in a pre framed way maybe even to get rid of the de di negative dynamics before they take root, right? That's why I talk about that bomb. It's there, if you don't extinguish it, it's gonna create roots and later, right? Because there was something going on in their mind and you didn't address it. Okay, so we talked about some people might be concerned. You're an investor. I don't know what time. 20 minutes, cool. You're an investor. So we're, we're, we're trapped in like There's an immediate savings of 8 to 20% by avoiding broker fees. So Now this sounds very scripted right now, right? So you're going to put it in your words and it's going to flow in the conversation. Okay, but this is like the meat. And that's my thing with scripts. That's why I don't really love scripts. I had some quotes and if you wanted with these slides, you could use that as your script. But really, this is the script. And then it's understanding each step, more word tracks, which happens by practicing. Okay, the meat of when they're an investor, how you can... Um, annihilate that objection, letting you know there's an immediate savings of 20 percent that you're not going to have to pay that you would if you were selling at retail. You've got broker fees, title costs, selling it as is, um, 
and then perfecting the opportunity cost and timing. There's a lot, a lot of people don't think of that. Sellers don't think about that, but that's a lot of money if you put a dollar, dollar amount on the value. Um, you can mention you're not planning to flip it, and if you're wholesaling, you're not planning to flip it. Uh, multiple exit strategies, just sold the property and then you place the cash cash, 1031s work really well, we talked about. What if they say, I don't know what it's worth? I, like I told you guys, my favorite is, well, what are your neighbors selling their homes for? Another thing, um, one of my sales guys used to use this a lot, Josh, he would say, well, do you want $1,000 or, or a million, or a couple million, all right? Just give them extremes, and then shut up, and let them say something. And then if they say something, like, well, I don't know. Oh, you don't know? <laughs> Right? Can mirror. Just be careful. Don't like mirror too much to where they're like, the person's just repeating. <laughs> so that's why I said earlier with board and stuff, I'm like, well, I can't just mirror, 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 but I can label and then mirror, and then use tactical empathy, and then, right? And I can do all that stuff. It's like a Swiss Army. That's why I say, whoever's going to grill me, we can, we can roll by one care over that. Um, beyond. I don't know where or what I'm moving, right? Um, so what you want to find, you're going to get that a lot if it's owner-occupied. Will you know where you're moving yet? Not really. Do you know why? Not totally sure. Okay, that's what you're going to say every single time. Well, if we gave you time to find a place and left it up uh, TC communication, and, and you could change the date if you need to, would that work, to you, work for you? What we're trying to find out is, is it really that they don't know where they're going yet, so they don't want to make a decision? Or do they know they're selling and they just haven't exactly found out yet and exactly determined when? Because if that's the case, a lot of times they'll make a deal, just a 90-day escrow or you know, whatever. And we just always do on or before, we'll put it out as far as they want, and then tell them, you know, hey, if you guys give us, you know, two, three weeks notice, whatever you guys think timeline you need to get the deal sold, we'll tell them, give us that much notice, and we'll put this in the contract, give us that much notice, and we'll bump up closing. We will also put a provision if we have to, we don't like to do this, but if we have to, and they say, well, what happens, we get to the end of the 90 days, or whatever date they wanted, and we haven't found something, it's not going as planned. You give us a heads up, and we can extend it. Okay? Just remove the objection, keep moving forward. Because timing should never be, if they're willing to sell their house today, when they want to close should never be. Now, if you can move it up and get paid quicker, obviously that's better, but I had a six-month uh, six escrow. This was like two years ago. It was an $85,000 deal. We, we did a wholesale with it, but it was $95,000 spread. We netted eighty five, dollars and it was a six-month escrow. We, we knew it was a home run the whole time. We just had to wait. The guy lived there for like 40 years, 3,000 square foot house filled with stuff. His daughter, grown daughter who lived with him was pregnant. He was like, I want to do this, but I just need six months. But okay, you know, it's nice to have some of those in your pipeline. Um, they might say, I can sell my house retail. I can sell my house by myself, and then I don't have to pay any fees. So absolutely you can. If you sell to someone with cash like me, um, or, I missed that, right? Absolutely you can, right? You can sell it your, yourself, and you don't have to pay fees if you sell it to me or someone like me. Um, you can label that. Sounds like you want to sell it to an investor, right? Certainly, uh, the finance buyers who pay retail and are a pain in the butt all have realtors who don't show, let alone sell your home, if you aren't paying them a big commission. You're kind of labeling what realtors do and saying if they bite on that. I'm not hating on a realtor, I've been one for nine years, but I am hating on realtors too. So. If they say I want as much money as possible, I appreciate that in the same way, right? Connect with them, we're all humans, like everybody wants as much money as possible. You've got me in a good situation, we talked about this, the situational thing. I gotta buy something right now. Please take it into consideration, it's gonna be cash. That's so back to the value proposition. Okay. Can you just come see the property? Now some of you guys might be like, yes, because you just want the appointment. Cool, you're done. Absolutely. I can meet you in 20 minutes. If you're trying to link the way we're doing it, and I'll talk about the the comparisons later in another session, but when you're asking them for the information um, and they're just telling you to come look at it, like so this is earlier on. Also, I'll, what we like to say is definitely I'm going to come do that. I'm going to come to the property, but I want to get some information from you first to make sure I can get you an offer that you like. Not immediately because they're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. I want you to come out and they'll want it. Now again, if you're just going on the appointment, you could hang up and come on the way, right? And go do everything else in person. I think it's just another one here. Can I say the money? Want as much money as possible, same way. Yeah, we just said that. I think it's just another point. Uh, if they say I'm getting more offers, right? We talked about competition. Like, okay, well, yeah, that's great. Just a heads up. Many, we talked, I, I use this one as an example. Many investors came from a weekend seminar, don't actually want to buy your house, so you're like telling them what wholesaling is kind of. 
very tactically. We're prepared to put in a non-refundable earnest money down. Obviously, make sure you're at a number that you want if you're going to do that, or that you know you can wholesale it. Um, we're uh, we have waived contingencies because we're professional buyers. So both those things. You're going to go non-refundable earnest money and big earnest money, and um, waive small contingencies. Then obviously make sure you're committed to the deal. But a lot of our biggest deals, there's been competition, and we're best deals. And there's been competition, and we get it even lower than competition because we went right to the elephant in the room that every other person is trying to avoid because they weren't going to be willing to do this. We separated ourselves. Um, and we'll, we'll even coach them in that situation. Make sure any offer that you're putting has $5,000 non refundable deposit, non refundable for any reason. If they won't do it, then call us because we will. Now, if they call us back and want us to do that, and then the, if they want us to also match this other person's offer and we won't, then we have that decision, but at least we have that decision. It's better to not have that decision. You can also ask them, what's your buy now price, right? So if they're like talking about competition, now it doesn't always work. Sometimes they're like, well, I don't, I don't really know yet. I'm gonna get my up, my up the offers first, and then I'll tell you that. But sometimes people will be like, well, if you give me X, right? And then you've anchored that, and you can get into that during the, the education process. All right, so real quick, through all that, the reason that we will, uh, actually, you know what? I'm gonna uh, cut it right there, because this gets into the offer process. So where I'll dovetail this into when I hit this next session on making the offer is, uh, is we'll talk about kind of why we've evolved into it. We have why we're so heavy on the phone, and Jake's there heavier on appointments, like we said earlier. Probably all you guys in the room, everyone's somewhere in that spectrum, but um, that'll give us a lot to think about. And then whether you're doing the offer process in person, at the appointment, or over the phone, it's, it's the exact same offer process, it doesn't matter. Cool.